The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. The Equitable Life Assurance Society is a great mutual institution organized to serve America. Therefore, one of the Equitable Society's major objectives is to make all possible contributions to the welfare and stability of American business on which so many of the Equitable Society's nearly four million members depend. Tonight's middle commercial is addressed to people who personally own some part of the business enterprise in which they are employed. For such owners, this commercial, due in about 14 minutes, will have information from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file... The Two Wise Men. In the past six months, there have been almost 380,000 fingerprint arrest records added to the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. An addition which brings the number of such fingerprint records to the staggering total of seven and a half million. That figure, seven and a half million, can be said quickly, can be rolled off the tongue and forgotten just as quickly. But your FBI asks you to stop for a moment and to realize what that figure represents. These cards represent seven and a half million people who have been arrested in the United States. Since we have slightly more than 140 million people in the country, it means that one out of every 18 among us has an arrest record. Your FBI implores you to do everything that you can to help fight the crime wave. Lest the next survey show that the figure has risen beyond its present high record, and we find ourselves literally engulfed in every type of crime, from larceny to murder. file opens in a small Midwestern town. It is early morning. Two men, one old, one young, are hard at work digging a hole with pick and shovel. What's the matter, Billy Paul? Hey, this is, this is kind of rugged. For a young fella like you. Why, your Uncle Andy and me do this kind of work all the time. Yeah, I know. I know. Come on, boy. Get to digging. Okay. I... Wish Uncle Andy was here now. What? I said I wish Uncle Andy was here now instead of me. <laughs> Once we agree, son, so do I. You know he'd be here too if his back wasn't all twisted up with rheumatism. Hey, tell me something, will you? What's that? Why do you old guys always do everything the hard way? What do you mean? Oh, why can't you use one of them drills on this hole? You could do the whole job ten times quicker. Billy, really? you think me and your uncle are pretty old-fashioned, don't you? Yeah, I thought so. Well, let me tell you something, son. There's a lot you could learn from our old-fashioned ways. Huh. Like what, for instance? Like what we're doing right now. Uh-huh. There's plenty of quick ways to do this same job. I'll grant you that. But once we're inside this bank, we can blow the vault and take the money without anybody ever knowing we're doing it. <laughs> The next day, FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor picks up Agent Carl Perry in front of the railroad station. Yo, Carl. Oh, Carl, over here. Oh, hello, Jim. Hi. Come on, hop in. Oh, thanks. Good. Good to see you. Well, I must say this is service being met at the station. <laughs> well, I didn't come down here to drive you back to the office. 
I just wanted to save us some time. Why, what's your right? We've been assigned to work together on a case that just came in. Oh, good. What's it all about? Well, there was a bank burglary in Centerville early this morning. Two men got into the bank by tunneling under the back of the building. Mm, any leads? Oh, we get more than leads, Carl. We know who did it. Already? Oh. Well, the robbers parked a car a block away from the bank in front of a home occupied by some people named Duncan. Uh-huh. Mr. Duncan looked out the window and copied down the number on the license plate so he could make a complaint about it. And his complaint turned out to be an asset. That's right. Oh, good boy. The car was found abandoned this morning at a tourist cabin out on Route 81. We got some fingerprints out of it. Turned out to belong to a man named Roy Lyons. I don't think I know that name. Oh, there's no reason why you should, Carl. From his record, he's been a petty larceny thief for about 45 years. Well, how old is he? 63. He was working with a boy of 19. How do you know that? Well, we found a jacket inside the bank that had an eyeglass case in one of the pockets. The case was initial WOC. Oh, oh the lights changed, Jim. Oh, yeah. Well, we went through Roy Lyons' arrest record. Found out he was picked up a year ago with a boy named William O'Caldwell. Well, that certainly ties in. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's safe to assume it's the same boy. We'll know in a little while, though, for sure. Why? Well, we're headed for the tourist camp where the robber's car was found abandoned. Oh? I've got pictures of Lyons and Caldwell in my pocket. Carl, if they make positive identification of the tourist camp, we can start our search from there. Andy? Yes, Roy? Care for a little more cocoa? Oh, not, not right now, thanks. Ooh, my back. Rheumatism's really acting up. Yes, I wish my nephew'd get back with that mustard plaster. Uh, you all done counting the money? Uh-huh. How much? $1,237.50. Not a bad night's work. Uh, too bad you couldn't have been with us. Well, I, I wasn't exactly idle. Well, what do you mean, Andy? I wrote some letters. What kind of letters? Uh, do you remember that sucker list I had in the trunk? Which one? Men over 60. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's the one we never knew how to use. I figured a way to put it to work. Well, good boy, Andy. How'd you do it? Well, we've been accumulating a lot of coins along with the paper money. It's tough for us to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. That's why I sent out the letters. We're starting a club. What kind of a club? One of them old age clubs. Oh. I'll be president. Good. You'll be treasurer. Fine. Uh, what's the uh, aims of the club? We're charging a dollar to join and a quarter a week dues. That way, nobody will be suspicious if we get a couple of hundred dollars in silver. Well, that's a real idea, Andy. Well, I'm glad to go. Oh, good. Darn that back. Can I get you something? Oh, no. Oh, where's Billy with the pastor? I told him to hurry. Eh? Andy, I'm afraid that boy does just as he pleases. Uh, how was he on the job last night? Mm, kind of fresh. I uh, don't like to say this, Andy. But he's getting a little too big for his bitches. How do you mean? He's been flashing money around, being a big shot. That could get us in trouble. It sure could. Oh, I'll have a talk with the boy as soon as he gets here. Yep, let me have some of that cocoa. Carl, I wish something had come in on that alarm on the old man and the boy. If they remained in the immediate neighborhood, I think they'd have been spotted by now. I'm afraid they've gotten to wherever they were going, though. These alarms don't produce results in the first five hours. They usually don't produce at all. Jim, if we could only get some kind of a lead that would tell us which way they headed when they left the tourist cabin. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to let this one go for a little while. You mean just quit on it? No, not exactly. While you were calling police headquarters, I went in to talk to the SAC. About what? About attacking this problem from an entirely new angle. What's that? Well, there was a bank burglary about ten days ago over at Midland Falls. The same method of entering the bank was used in both cases. Mm, I didn't know that. Well, the bank at Midland Falls was not covered by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's why we haven't been in on it up to now. Oh, I see. I think the same pair probably robbed both banks. Mm, that's a safe speculation, Jim. Well, the SAC has given us permission to work on the Midland Falls burglary because, well, solving that one would automatically solve the other case for us, too. Well, what do we do first, Jim? Well, Midland Falls is only about 65 miles from here. Let's drive up there first thing in the morning. <laughs> Uh, 
How does your back feel now, Andy? Still miserable, Roy. Oh. I was thinking we might go back to work tomorrow night. I got a bank all picked out for us. Where? Well, coming home from Centerville the other night, we went through a little place called Bowling Green. They've got the prettiest little bank there you ever saw. I remember Bowling Green. Got arrested there once. Uh, did you stop and uh, look the bank over? No need to. There's a vacant lot next door. I think that pipe's out, Andy. Yeah. Hand me the tobacco, will you? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi. Well, where have you been? Out. Thought you went to get your poor uncle a back plaster. I forgot. Uh, Billy, you've been forgetting too many things here lately. Mostly manners. You now don't... look, I don't want to hear any long-winded lectures. I'm fed up with those routines. Is that a fact? Yes. And I came home here specially to tell you that. They must be spiking the grape juice down at the pool. Huh. Very funny. You're talking mighty big, son. Uh, it's time I did. I've been kicked around by you two just long enough. What do you mean, kicked around? I've been doing 50% of the work. For 50% of the work, I want 50% of the money. Look, son... We brought you into this combination strictly as an apprentice. Uh, that is right. And we tried to teach you all we know. <laughs> what do you think I could learn from old-fashioned jokers like you? Oh. Ah, you're 50 years behind the times, both of you. Then why do you work for us? I'm not after tonight. But before I pull out, there's uh, one thing we got to get straight. What's that? The payoff from last night. I want half. Yeah, you may want half, son, but you ain't getting it. I got a gun here that says I am. Well. Now, where'd you put the money? Put that gun away, son. It might go off and scare all of us. Look, I'm on the level about this. Uh, Roy, I believe he is. Now, get me that money. Uh, you better do as he says, Roy. Uh, very well. Oh, oh. <laughs> Good work, Roy. Get his gun. Right. Oh. Well, what happened? Pull the rug out from under you, that's all. <laughs> That's one of them old-fashioned things you was complaining about. <laughs> Come on, Andy. Let's tie him up. We will return to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI in just a minute. Now a brief case from the official files of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, showing how equitable business insurance helps stabilize our American economic system. Names used are fictitious, but the case is an actual one. We are in the office of Mr. Edward Bradshaw, president of a successful metal parts business in New England. Harry Summers, our executive vice president, takes complete charge of personnel purchasing and manufacturing. George Gibbon is our sales manager. He knows all our customers. He brings in the business. Sounds like two pretty valuable men to me. Yes, they certainly are. If we lost either one, it would take months to replace them. And that's what used to keep me lying awake at night, trying to figure out what I'd do if either one of them should die. Well, you don't look like a worried man to me now, Mr. Bradshaw. I'm not. I got the answer from an Equitable Society business insurance specialist. His suggestion was $50,000 worth of insurance on the lives of each of these two key men. Payable to the company. And that would tide you over the period while you're looking around for a replacement. Right. And it would help pay for the replacement when we found him. I look on this life insurance on our key man as a safeguard for the security of every man and woman who works for us. No question about it, that equitable society business insurance specialist certainly took a load off my mind. Right, Mr. Bradshaw. And now let me extend an invitation from the equitable society to the businessmen in this radio audience. An Equitable Society business insurance specialist will be glad to sit down with you and your associates. He's fully qualified by experience and training to work out a plan that's sound in every detail and tailor-made for your business. Have your secretary call the nearest Equitable office and ask for the manager. Or dictate a brief note to the home office of the Equitable Society in New York City. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> And now back to the FBI file, The Two Wise Men.
The attitude of the young man in tonight's case from the files of your FBI is too widespread to require any explanation. It is almost one of the prerequisites of youth that they think they know how to do things better than those who are older. And as you have seen, that attitude is as true among criminals as among law-abiding citizens. The young man you have met, unfortunately, is representative of the dominant age group among those who have been arrested since the first of this year. According to the FBI survey mentioned earlier in this program, the highest frequency of arrests occurred in the 21, 22, 23, and 19-year-old groups in that order. The age group 50 and over, represented tonight by the two old men, was not far behind in this newest survey. Between them, those age groups combined to produce a total of approximately one-third of all recorded arrests. Many of the youngsters, those in the 19 to 23 bracket, are yesterday's juvenile delinquents. The boys of that age group are still young enough to be saved. Indeed, they must be saved. For if society should fail them entirely, they will soon cease to be yesterday's juvenile delinquents. Instead... They will be tomorrow's hardened criminals. Tonight's file continues late the next afternoon in a room at police headquarters in Midland Falls. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Carl. I just got back here, Jim. Oh, how'd you make out? Well, after I left you, I went to the bank. Uh huh. They couldn't give us much information, which we didn't already have. But I did get this, uh, this nail puller. No? From whom? From Mr. Crawford at the bank. It was left in the vaults the night of the burglary. Let me take a look at that, huh? Mm-hmm. The name stamped on it. It's pretty well rubbed out, though. I put it under black light and read it. It oh. says uh, E.G. Bentley and Company Lumber. Well, that's a local company. Did you mm-hmm. call them? Uh, yes, but they haven't given away any of these nail pullers for over ten years. Well, that takes care of the possibility of tracing it directly, then. Yeah. Well, maybe it'll fit in later on. How did you make out? All the local police and I interviewed every person in Midland Falls. <laughs> no wonder you've been gone all day. Yeah. After comparing notes, I found that the car used in the burglary here was a stolen 1946 black Buick convertible. Mm-hmm. Checking on the license number, I learned the car was stolen from a private garage at Newton Center on September 19th. 19th? Well, that was ten days before the bank here was burglarized. That's right. Oh, any prints found in the car? Yes. Yes, prints identified as those of Lyons and of Corwell. That figured. In examining the car after it had been abandoned, a large jack, the kind they use on tractors, was found in it. Was the car stolen from a farmer, Jim? No. No, that's why I think they probably stole the jack somewhere else. Carl, hand me that map over there, will you? Oh, sure. sure. Here you are. Yeah, spread it on there. Hold it down there. Huh? Get back. Now, here, Carl. Hmm? If you were to take this territory in here, uh-huh. on the east and the south of Midland Falls, uh-huh. I'd take the west and the north. We could interview every farmer around here and see if we can find out where that jack came from. Okay. When we're finished, let's meet back here. <laughs> You know something, Roy? What? Maybe we should have stayed home and answered our mail. We'd have made more money that way. On the old AIDS club, you mean? Yeah. The letters are flocking in. Why did you dangle at those fellas to make it sound so good? I well, told them we'd ask the government for a dollar a week for every year they've been alive. Well, that means I'd get $63 a week. That's right. If I were sure of getting that, I wouldn't be driving to Bowling Green in the dead of night to uh, rob a bank. <laughs> that is a good point. Andy, well, have you made up your mind yet about what you're going to do with young Billy? No. It ain't going to be practical to keep him tied up in the bedroom too long. I know. What would you do if you was me? <laughs> That's easy. I'd kill him. Carl, Carl, I came up lucky. I found the farmer that Jack was stolen from. Oh, good. He said that an old man and a young boy in a 1946 black Buick convertible stopped at his farm on September 29th. Well, wasn't that the day of the burglary here? That's right. He said they came to his farm and wanted to borrow a Jack so they could change a tire. Was he sure that it was Lyons and Caldwell? Yes, yes, he positively identified both pictures. Oh, they also stole that nail puller from his tool chest. Well, we've certainly got enough evidence now. Yeah, but that hasn't stopped them. 
They committed another burglary last night on a federally insured bank. What? Yeah, they employed their same modus operandi on a bank in Bowling Green. Well, they didn't waste much time. Yeah, I know. That's one of the reasons we'd better catch them in a hurry. Carl, let's see where we stand, huh? Take a look at the map. Okay. Now, over here, approximately 55 miles from Midland Falls is Newton Center. That's right. The car that was used to burglarize the bank in Midland Falls on September 29th was stolen from Newton Center 10 days earlier on September 19th. Uh-huh. Now, this farm where the jack and the nail puller was stolen is here. That's about six miles due west of Midland Falls. Uh-huh. Now, that means two things, Carl. First, Lyons and Caldwell came into Midland Falls from the west. They were at this farm on the day of the big burglary. How? Correct? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, from Newton Center to this farm is approximately 49 miles. That's right. Now, if they were fleeing from Newton Center after stealing the car, they certainly would have covered more distance than 49 miles in 10 days. I'll buy that. Well, then, Carl, I think we can assume that during the period between the stealing of the car and the burglarizing in the Midland Falls Bank, they lived somewhere in between. Oh, Jim, it'll be a big job checking every house in that 50-mile stretch. Yeah, I know that, Carl, but if they stopped at the farm to fix a flat, they might very well have had some other trouble with that tire. Well, maybe. I think what we ought to do now is start checking every gas station between that farm and Newton Center. No luck here, Carl. We've covered 25 miles already. Yeah, I know that. They couldn't have had too much trouble with that tire. Any chance they use another road, Jim? There is no other road between Newton Center and Midland Falls. So let's go, Carl. We've got to keep trying. No luck here either. Only nine more miles to Newton Center, Jim. Yeah, maybe we're betting on a dead horse. Doesn't even look like they stopped at any of these places for gas, let alone tire repair. Well, Jim, there can't be too many more gas stations. We only need one, Carl. Let's go. Carl, we hit the jackpot. You mean they were in here? Yes, on September 26th. Well, that's a week after the car was stolen. That's right. The descendants said they live somewhere in this immediate neighborhood. I think there's a way to find their exact address. Come on, let's drive into the nearest town before the store is closed. <laughs> Me, Andy. Oh, where have you been? Just took a little walk. Thought I'd leave you alone so you could make up your mind. About what? Your nephew. Oh, that was real thoughtful of you, Roy. Well, after all, the boy is your flesh and blood. I knew it'd be hard for you to decide. You made up your mind yet? Uh Uh-huh. What did you decide? Don't see any way out but to kill him. Oh. But, Andy, I don't want you to do it. Huh? You're too old to start killing anyone now. Oh, I'm not going to. I call that young fellow Green. He does that type of work, you know. I've heard he's a nice, polite young fellow. Yes, I I like throwing a boy like that whatever work I can. This will be good experience for him, too. When did he say he'd be able to take care of it? We promised he'd be over later this evening. Oh, fine. Uh, did you mail those letters while you were out? Uh-huh. And I picked up this batch from the box. My goodness. Club is certainly growing. We're getting a lot of money from this. I know, but that's not our money. It belongs to the members. It wouldn't be very honest uh, of us to touch it. Oh, I uh, guess that's the young man who's going to take care of my nephew. Well, I'll go let him in. Uh, thanks, Roy. Are you Mr. Green? No, I'm Mr. Taylor. Your name is Roy Lyons. That's right. How did you know? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh. We've got warrants here for the arrest of you and William O. Caldwell, Carl. Yeah. See if Caldwell is any place in the apartment. Right, Jim. Uh, Mr. Green, bring a friend to help him, Roy. Uh, no, Andy. These men are from the FBI. Oh? Looking for Billy? I'm looking for all of you. Now, come along with me. Andy Spencer received a 50-year sentence for bank burglary, and Roy Lyons and Bill Caldwell received 25 years each. Once the two special agents of your FBI were able to determine in what vicinity the trio of bank burglars resided, they were able to use an earlier clue, the eyeglass case bearing the initials W.O.C., 
the optician in that particular neighborhood identified the eyeglass case as having been delivered to William O. Caldwell, and he supplied young Caldwell's address. Caldwell's subsequent confession closed the files on all three bank burglaries. And thus, your FBI was able to prevent the further looting of banks in which you have your money deposited by this calculating trio. Tonight's case illustrates to what length the special agents of your FBI will go in protecting your property. For in this investigation, in a period of 72 hours, they interviewed not only every resident of Midland Falls, and that included every man, woman, and child, but also every farmer in the territory for six miles around Midland Falls. And then, every gas station attendant along a main highway for a distance of 55 miles. That is hard work. But the special agents of your FBI have been trained to realize that the only way to investigate a crime is to do it thoroughly. And in almost every case, that means hard work. More hard work, and still more, until the criminal is caught. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about business insurance. The reason why the Equitable Society emphasizes this type of insurance is very simple. The brains and experience responsible for the success of a business enterprise have a cash value and should therefore be protected by insurance like any other valuable asset. Equitable Society representatives have worked out plans for all types of business from progressive corner stores and successful law partnerships to large organizations with thousands on their payrolls. Plan now to enlist the invaluable help that is yours for the asking from a trained business insurance specialist of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story exposing the clever hoax perpetrated by a trio of expert con men. Its subject, fraud. Its title, The Gridiron Swindle. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Gridiron Swindle on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.